if we were to assume that equity markets lead economic growth or contraction, uh, let's just take that assumption. Um, if we were to accept that assumption, then can't you make the argument that an economic recovery is on the way? Well, not recovery, but um, boom or growth is on the way, considering how high the equity markets have gone. Makes sense. I mean, Americans own a lot of stocks. But if instead you have a look at the correlation between stock prices and the actual consumer spending, so not the sentiment, David, but the actual hard number, the consumer spending, there is not much correlation. Because people spend more money, not when equity markets are going up. People spend more money when their wages are going up, when the labor market is hot, when the economy is running hot. Alfonso Picatello joins us today. He is the author of The Macro Compass, and he has a very dire prediction for us, for the global economy. Stay tuned to listen to what he has to say, and we'll be talking about his upcoming uh, macro hedge fund. Very exciting. Stay tuned until the end to learn about our sponsor, Incogni, which is a VPN that offers unique privacy benefits. Learn more at the end of the interview. Uh, Alfonso, welcome back to the show. David, always a pleasure to chat with you. How are you doing? Um, very well. Thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, I know you're doing well. Congratulations on the Macro Compass. And you have a very important announcement. You are starting your own hedge fund. So let's talk about that in a minute. Uh, yeah. I want everybody to know about your future plans. Uh, first, let's talk about some of your more recent research on the Macro Compass. Uh, it says here, tactically, the ideal playbook will be similar to July to August 2023 period, which is to short 30-year treasuries towards 4.75%. Monetize and move to short vulnerable stocks on max euphoria. And third, buy cheap options on Fed to actually deliver a more robust cutting cycle. Let's walk through these. So short 30-year treasuries. Uh, what are you expecting here? What's the assumption behind that play? The assumption is that um, markets at some point will believe that something has changed in the United States, David that this time is different. You know, it's a typical late cycle story. The Fed has raised interest rates. The economy is still holding on okay. Yes. So it must be different this time, right? It must be that the neutral interest rate is higher, that the US economy is stronger structurally. And I think the Federal Reserve will endorse this view by raising their long run dot at their dot plot, either in March or in April. So that's the longest, run, longest dot on their dot plot, which today is at two and a half percent. That is the Federal Reserve neutral interest rates. That's what they think the US can handle as the average interest rates to deliver potential GDP growth. I think they'll have to raise it. They'll have to raise it and therefore signal to markets that they think the US economy is structurally stronger. And so as they, as they do, then maybe investors think, well, okay, then we should push long end yields higher as well, right? Because the economy can handle it. And you know that's no problem. The economy can handle 4.5% interest rates forever. And I think that will be a mistake. That will be a policy mistake. And that policy mistake is exactly the same, David, that Powell and the Fed did in September, October 2018. Do you remember when Powell said, we are far away from neutral. We think we should raise interest rates more. We think the US economy is stronger structurally. And then uh, he froze the credit market. Apple went down 20% in six weeks. Mm. And then in January 19, he had to pivot. I think they will make the same policy mistake this time again. So you first short the bond market on that euphoria. In the first leg, stock markets don't care. Because, you know, it's everything is new, it's shiny and different, David. And so NVIDIA is now worth more than Canadian GDP, and it goes yeah. up every day. And I think that is euphoria, is sentiment that you cannot stop with higher interest rates until higher interest rates go higher mm -hmm. and until the dollar goes higher. And at that point, stocks have to take notice as well. But that's the second stage of my game plan. We'll let the world um, of capitalism decide which is more important, NVIDIA chips for AI development or Canadian economy. Anyway, that's a topic of a different dis for a different discussion. <laughs> okay. Now, you have, you have done research on when you think the Fed would likely pivot. The CME Fed watch tool is pricing in a significant probability of a cut by June. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in your report, you said that they might keep rates higher for longer. Is June in line with your expectations then? I think ultimately they cut in June. Um, the discussion to be had here is what the market will believe they do after they've done three cuts. Why do I say three cuts? Because politically they want to start before the election starts You know, heating up in the discussions and in the campaign. They don't want to be politicized necessarily, right? So they start earlier. They start in June, 
then they do another cut in September, then maybe another cut in December. Okay, all nice. The market is pricing exactly that, as you said. But then what happens after? Because if the cycle looks like 1995, for example, then the Federal Reserve back then just cut three times and then they stopped. They didn't go ahead with further cuts. They only cut three times. And I think there is a chance the market believes that this time they will do exactly like in 1995. 1995 is the only soft landing we ever achieved. The market right now is close to max euphoria. Everybody can only talk about a soft landing. My recession probability is derived from options. David, only assign a 10% probability of a recession in the next 12 months. That's what the market thinks today. The market thinks a recession is a no-go. It's not going to happen. It's a soft landing. It's max euphoria. And so if they do the same, you know, the Fed at the end might end up cutting only three times. And if they cut only three times, then bond yields have to remove higher again. And I think there is a tipping point where this idea that the US economy can handle 4.5% forever, it's soft landing, will face a very different reality down the road. The, the reality is that they cannot handle 4.5% for no, very long? No, they can't. So, I mean, there is this narrative around that um, AI is going to revolutionize the world, right? That's one of the reasons why people are now saying the story, you know, it's, everything is different because AI is going to lead to a boost in productivity. And I want to ask something. We had the internet. That was a freaking revolution with hindsight, right? It penetrated all sectors of the economy. Sure. And now if you measure productivity growth from, let's say, the 80s to today, you will see that productivity has gone up a bit. It has, like it normally does. We become a bit more productive year after year, but we haven't gained all that productivity so to push real interest rates and equilibrium interest rates structurally higher. We haven't. And now artificial intelligence all of a sudden is going to be the new revolution. I think it's a nice narrative. It sounds very nice, but it's not going to have such an impact so that the U.S. economy can handle 4.5% interest rates forever. I mean, all the leveraged commercial real estate, the housing market and everything, do they care about artificial intelligence? You've got to pay your mortgage. You've got to pay your, your liabilities. And if interest rates are very high, that doesn't work, David. That doesn't work. Uh, I'm going to come back to markets in the Fed in just a minute, but since you brought up AI, do you think that the developments of AI and technological progress, generally speaking, is disinflationary yes. long term? Yes, of course it is. It's disinflationary because it basically reduces the needs for labor or labor intensive industries. All of a sudden, you can make the example that before the internet, to make a million in sales, David, it took seven employees for the standard US company. And after mm -hmm. the internet, it takes one and a half employees, two employees. So there is less needs for wage growth, for hiring people, for labor intensive industries, and that pushes down inflation over time, obviously. And so AI won't be anything different from that. It's, it's new technology, and new technology is disinflationary by definition. Here instead, we're talking about a gaining productivity so large that it would push the equilibrium interest rates of the US economy higher. I don't think that's gonna happen, or not in a, in a meaningful sense. I think this is a narrative. As every narrative, it gets pushed to the extreme, max euphoria. We aren't there yet, but we're getting pretty close. Okay, let's finish uh, on the Fed, and then but before we move on, you said that they're about to make a policy mistake. Can you clarify exactly what this policy yeah. mistake is? So the policy mistake would be to only cut a few times this year and to communicate to markets mm. that the mutual interest rates has gone higher. So that basically means, David, that they do not to in intend to cut interest rates back to 2 or 3% over time, but that they will only do a few cuts and stop there. And that's the policy mistake because it disappoints market expectations in bond markets. It pushes bond yields higher. And I think at some point it will cause this persistent increase in bond yields. It will cause some refinancing issues in commercial real estate, in the housing market, in fragile uh, sectors, in, in the corporate market. It's bound to cause a problem at some point. The longer you carry these interest rates higher, the higher the chance something bad happens along the road. Okay. And you mentioned as well in your report that there is going to be an avalanche of bond supply coming. Uh, and you have a chart showing the large amount of bonds in the orange yeah. uh, uh, bars uh, versus the private sector needs to absorb Q1 and Q2 2024. Can you expand on this? Yeah, so what's happening now is that Yellen has decided to front load a lot of the bond issuance, the, the long duration bond issuance, so the 20 year, 30 year bond issuance that the private sector needs to absorb, that needs to buy this issuance. She has decided to front load a portion of that in Q1 and Q2. 
So the result has been that increasingly high deficits and also a move towards issuing more coupon bonds, so 20-year, 30-year bonds, have basically concentrated a lot of the long, heavy supply in the first half of the year. And so we are witnessing that, right? We have these auctions that are tailing. So tailing means that, let's say, there is a, a wobbly demand out there in auctions for some of these bonds sometimes because the amount of bonds to absorb all at once by the private sector is quite large. So we have this risk on the horizon as well, where I think there is a chance that a couple of these auctions don't go particularly well because the demand from investors is relatively tepid or because the supply is just too concentrated all at one time. And that will probably add a bit to the uncertainty around bond deals. All of this, all of this is the first step in the game plan. So bond deals somehow move higher because of this recognition of neutral interest rates being higher because of this Fed policy mistake. In the first leg, equity markets don't care, exactly like in July last year. If you remember in July 23, mm -hmm. bond deals were going up and the Nasdaq was going up. The Nasdaq didn't care. AI was driving it also in summer last year. But at some point in August, you had a drawdown. You had a recognition that higher yields were waiting on the economy. And I think we're going to see exactly the same pattern this time. Just to clarify, you're talking about the long end of the curve, 10-year yields, 30-year yields? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if we are talking about a higher neutral interest rate, then also five-year interest rates have to go up. In general, bond yields have to go up a bit from here. Yes. I don't expect, again, that we will revisit 5%. But, you know, if you move from 45 to 475 and you keep these rates there for a long period of time, it will become at some point heavy for the stock market and for the economy. The principle is the same. The Fed has raised interest rates from zero to 525%, and it has kept these rates high already for a few quarters. The longer, David, you keep these interest rates high, the higher the chance that there is an accident down the road. If you believe that the longer end of the curve will go up, I'm assuming then if the Fed does cut rates eventually, the two-year, the shorter end of the curve, will move down with the Fed funds rate. That may signal that the yield curve will uh, steepen, correct? Doesn't that mean, usually when the yield curve steepens, doesn't that signal an improvement in economic growth? So you're right on the steepening of the curve. I think the sequence is... The long end goes up, there is a policy mistake, equity markets or credit markets take notice and they drop. And so the Federal Reserve is called to take action. And so the, the short end of, bo of, the bo of, the, of bond yields comes down, right? And so the curve steepens, okay? So that's generally the pattern that then leads. Um, in, in principle, it can lead to two things. The steepening of the yield curve, so when short end yields are going down faster than long end yields are, can mean two things, David. The first is that the economy is doing fine. If the economy is doing fine, what you will have is that if the Fed cuts interest rates, the long end says, well, that's great because you're cutting interest rate in a strong economy and therefore long end yields will go up reflecting a stronger prospect for growth and inflation in five years, in 10 years, right? Because mm -hmm. the Fed is cutting now, but the economy is growing and so the curve can steepen down the road. That's the positive steepening of the curve. Right now, instead, we're talking about a negative steepening of the curve. We're talking about the boost steepening that precedes recessions in principle. So that's a boost steepening where the Federal Reserve is called to act urgently. So front-end bond yields drop dramatically, anticipating a severe cutting cycle by the Federal Reserve, a repair cutting cycle, in other words, and the long end of the curve can't follow fast enough. So you need to discern, really, when mm. the steepening is happening. Is it happening because things are good, Mm -hmm. So then it's the steepening you're talking about, or is it happening because the Fed has made a policy mistake, credit markets are having a problem somewhere, or equity markets too, and then we're forced to cut and repair this problem? That's a boost steepen steepening that just precedes every recession. If we were to assume that equity markets lead economic growth or contraction, uh, let's just take that assumption. Um, if we were to accept that assumption, then can't you make the argument that an economic recovery is on the way, well, not recovery, but um, boom or growth is on the way, considering how high the equity markets have gone. Let, let's address that. Maybe I'm making a mistake here. No, it's it's a, a very valid question. You can also see a correlation between equity markets and consumer confidence. Mm -hmm. So all these surveys, you know, the University of Michigan Consumer uh, Sentiment Survey, for example, when the equity markets were hitting lows in October last year, also the consumer sentiment was very low. And it makes sense. I mean, Americans own a lot of stocks. But if instead you have a look 
at the correlation between stock prices and the actual consumer spending, so not the sentiment, David, but the actual hard number, the consumer spending, there is not much correlation. Because people spend more money, not when equity markets are going up. People spend more money when their wages are going up, when the labor market is hot, when the economy is running hot. And right now, the economy is doing okay. It's been slowing down for a bit, especially the labor market. It's not recessionary, but it's not booming either. So I think you have consumers that are watching their paper wealth maybe improve. That might improve their sentiment, but it doesn't improve the real spending. The real spending improves if their cost of debt goes down, mortgage rates go down, credit card debt costs go down, and if their wages are going up. And none of the two really is happening that much lately, right? I mean, the cost of their debt has gone up, mortgage rates are higher, credit card debt costs are higher, etc. Their car loans are higher in costs. And their wages have been doing okay, just maybe matching inflation, not even. So the real spending isn't linked to equity market performance. I'm going to ask you a very unscientific and uneconomic question, which sure. is, do you feel like there's a recession coming? <laughs> okay. But, uh, do you so, Personally, when you live your life, do you think to yourself, things are going to get worse? Okay. So I'm going to answer this with a straight no. Okay. And this is an interesting now because- Okay. This, the one that didn't happen in 2023, was instead the most anticipated, the most forecast recession mm -hmm. yes. ever that was supposed to happen. I remember posting a chart on Twitter, 45% of the economists surveyed in December 22 said there's going to be a recession in 2023. And now, funnily enough, when that happens, also the CFOs of the companies are already making repairs. They're preparing, they're being more conservative, they're not taking risks, David, right? So mm -hmm. when you feel a recession is coming, does it not by definition negate the possibility of a recession coming? Because your behavior you know, it's pretty conservative. You're not taking risks. You're not ridiculously doing stupid stuff. When you do stupid stuff, funnily enough, that's when a recession tends to happen. In 2001, a recession happened. And in 2000, people were doing stupid stuff, right? In 2008, yeah. a recession happened. And in 2007, people were doing stupid stuff in the housing market. So I think there is almost this inverse correlation between your feeling and the likelihood of a recession. Okay. There is, yes, yes. I mean, it also depends who you're asking, right? If it's somebody wealthy, I mean, it doesn't really matter how he feels um, in, in regards to a recession because he's probably going to be okay. Uh, so yes, I, that was, I just wanted to gauge your personal sentiment. So thank you for that. You have a very important chart here, uh, your credit impulse, which has historically been very good at predicting growth or recessions. Uh, the orange line here indicates negative or co a contraction in the credit impulse. Tell us the significance of yeah. the credit impulse. So the credit impulse measures the amount of money that we're printing in the largest economies in the world. And this money is the money we can spend. It's inflationary form of money, okay? So when the five largest economies in the world are putting a lot of money into yes. David Lin's pockets, there is a good chance that with a bit of time, David Lin will start spending a ton of money. <laughs> and when he does, the Canadian economy, as we all know, goes through the roof. Just joking, but the reality is when they do print more spendable money, then people tend to spend more and the aggregate demand goes up and therefore earnings grow up and potentially also inflation goes up. And now when they print less money, so fiscal is a bit more timid, credit creation is a bit lower. So we don't really get a lot of money being printed our way. We tend to spend a bit less. And so this inflation happens and the economy slows down. And now the credit impulse has effectively been saying for now 12 months that inflation had peaked. Okay. And we were going to see a disinflationary process. And we have seen one. And I think it can continue a little bit more until the summer with some bumps down the road. Growth has also been, you know, coming down and the labor market as well has been softening. The credit impulse was saying that this process should have happened faster. And why it's, it doesn't happen that fast? Probably because the U.S. fiscal stimulus has offset some of that potential downfall and because the lags this time in the cycle are a bit longer. So I'm in this camp. I think you got to be patient. The economy is slowing down. It takes right. a little bit longer. But most importantly, one thing, it's not only about the US. When people tell me, uh, where is it going to break? Where should I look? Where should I be careful? Uh, is it commercial real estate in the US? My answer is, uh, guys, all the economies in the world have raised the interest rates by 500 basis points. Canada has done the same. Europe has done the same. The UK has done the same. Do you think all these economies are able to handle as well this tightening as the US did? 
I think you should broaden your horizon when you're looking for potential risks. Ultimately, uh, let's talk about ultimately your market outlook. You have a, uh, <laughs> you tweeted three months ago, uh, the S and P five hundred will be, and then the, the highest uh, rate of response is between forty five hundred points and fifty one fifty. Now it's actually been upgraded, according to your more recent survey earlier in February. Uh, people you polled on Twitter X believe it's going to be between forty eight hundred points to fifty two hundred points. Uh, what are we at right now? We are at uh, 5,087. So somewhere in line with uh, actually uh, your poll's expectations for the end of the year. But you mentioned this is a powerful contrarian indicator because Very. of, because of <laughs> who you're Very polling. powerful. Okay. I, I love that. I love that. So look, what happens is the following. You ask the crowd on social media. And I get I get on average five seven thousand replies to this thing, so it's a it's a very large sample. Yes, yes. And they will tell you how they feel, David. They will tell you how, how you know are they bearish? Are they bullish? What do they feel like? Okay. And there is quite a contrarian power into this poll. I've done it multiple times, and it really works. So back in November or December, people told me that the S and P was was headed for forty five hundred with yeah. high conviction. With yeah. high conviction, okay? Uh -huh. And that was actually a pretty bullish signal because since then, the S&P has only gone up. That's basically never stopped going up, right? Yes, yes. And so it was effectively that answer to that poll was the summation of the bearish sentiment that was still there in November despite the S&P was already rallying. People were like, I don't believe it. It's not happening. I don't like that. The S&P should be 4,500. Okay, now you do ask the poll again, right? And the poll says, nah, it's like uh, 51, 5200. So markets are getting more bullish, are they? People are more comfortable with the rally in the S&P. Do you know when I'm going to turn short? When I'm going to put that poll and everybody will be saying 5500, 5600. It has to go to the moon because that probably means people are particularly bullish. There is a certain line of thought that being contrarian works. Why? Because when everyone is bullish, who's the new marginal buyer? It's pretty simple. If everybody's bullish and already has bought, who's the new marginal buyer? Sorry, sorry. The the the, the current level is in line with uh, the polls' expectations. What what what's the contrarian play here? Is it no? There there is no contrarian play here yet. Okay. So my point is, the game plan is that I think bond markets are gonna sell off and equity okay. markets are gonna ignore it for the time being. They're gonna ignore it. Okay, the dollar is gonna appreciate. Bond markets are going to maybe sell off a bit. At some point, maybe in a few weeks, the euphoria will be so extreme that if I put a new poll out, you should have a look at that. I will in a few weeks. And I will ask people, David, what do you think the S&P should be in three months? If they say 5,400, 5,500, so they become really bullish, that's probably your contrarian signal that you should be short the stock markets at that point. So right now, there is no contrarian play. I think, but if you wait a bit longer for a couple of weeks, this euphoria might go up even further until it becomes a good contrarian signal to get short. I'd like to spend two minutes on Bitcoin and then I want to talk about your upcoming fund. Bitcoin has defied gravity uh, this year uh, and most of last year, above $50,000 now. Is it on its way to breach new all-time highs this year, Alfonso? New all time highs. Yeah. Okay. That's solid. Seven, let's say, let's say uh, $70,000 by the end of the year. Okay. Wow. So let me answer this. I think you're going to get relatively close. So I think you're going to mm. probably see the 60,000s at some point. Mm -hmm. And then people will get extremely bulled up there as well, where they think this is going to new highs, right? The same type of euphoria we might want to see in NASDAQ, in AI, in media type of stocks. Yeah. And then probably gravity will kick in and you'll have a sell off. It, it, it's really just fascinating for me because the percentage growth of Bitcoin over the last one year has been tremendous. Uh, you know, it went from 15,000 now to 50,000. Now, last time we had this kind of growth. Cryptos, Bitcoin was the headline news all over mainstream media, and every single not. channel. Now, yeah, exactly. Why, 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 why the absolute disinterest despite similar price patterns? So I think it's quite interesting what you're saying, and it's a signal that the euphoria in Bitcoin is not that high this time. So it can rally further. And generally, you have these studies that show that when the economist is making a front page saying Bitcoin is back then it means that you can sell Bitcoin at that point, right? It's really fun. It's it's how it works. 
So I'm going to wait for the economist to publish a front page cover telling me that media is going <laughs> to eat the world alive. And then at that point, maybe I can short stock markets. Really, sentiment matters. Seriously, I'm a macro investor, yes. so I make all these analysis about the macro conditions. But narrative and sentiment are really, really important in the process of investing. That there's no relationship, final question, there's no relationship between the Fed policy and Bitcoin, you think? Oh, that's a great question. I think there is. Um, and particularly, Bitcoin as a macro asset class benefits when the Federal Reserve is keeping policy accommodative despite the economies running hot. Then Bitcoin does really, really, really well. So think about the second half of 2020, the first half of 2021. We were reopening the economies, right? I mean, we threw a lot of money at the economy. The economy was doing okay. We were reopening the economies and the Fed kept interest rates at zero. Mm -hmm. And that's when Bitcoin goes fast, fast, fast on the way up. As a macro asset class, that's the best environment for Bitcoin. Yeah, makes sense. I want to learn a bit more about your fund, your upcoming fund. First of all, what, what kind of a fund is this going to be? Is this, I'm guessing it's a macro fund. Yeah, that's correct. It's a macro fund. It's a macro fund which is uh, not open to uh, large institutional investors because I've done that already when, uh, when I was doing my previous job. It's open to people. So people who want to allocate into macro strategies because they see opportunities over the next five, 10 years, because fiscal is all over the place, because demographics are changing, because countries around the world are doing different fiscal policies, there will be plenty of macro opportunities. That's why the fund is opening. So when you say people, what do you mean? Accredited investors or? or... <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, accredited investors, but I okay. mean that I, I am much happier taking on investors that are private individuals, basically, right. than I am okay. in taking large, large institutions into the fund. Okay. And and can you maybe, you know, in, in as much detail as you can right now, tell us about how you plan to execute some of your strategies. Are you going to pick stocks? Are you going to go with the broad ETFs? Are you going to yeah. be asset class agnostic? How, how are you playing your strategies is my so question. Global macro is a strategy that tries to benefit from any inconsistencies in any asset classes around the world. Look, it's a very flexible strategy. Most of the, of the strategy is going to be revolving around futures, options, and ETFs. So mm -hmm. liquid instruments, tradable and liquid uh, in jurisdictions around the world. So it takes opportunities wherever they're available. Might be in Australia, might be in Canada, might be in the US. I'm a bond uh, investor in the first place. So a lot of the opportunities out there are in bond markets and will be in bond markets, but also currencies, commodities, equity markets, any global macro opportunity available out there will be potentially part of the strategy of the fund, all using futures, options, and liquid ETFs. Okay. Uh, are you planning to rebalance quarterly, monthly? Are you are you actively trading it, passively trading it? How are you doing this? So the portfolio has uh, several strategies. Uh, one is called macro identification regime. So the models run on the background to identify in which macro regime are we in right now. And mm -hmm. then it takes position long, short, and different asset classes to benefit from the macro regime we're in. And this is a, a more, more of a, a long-term running strategy on the background. And then there are more tactical strategies. Some of them are relative value trades. Some of them are narrative driven trades some of them are option strategies so it's a blend of strategies together to make sure that the returns are uncorrelated to the s p 500 this should be a complement into investors portfolios so they run their portfolios they have their allocation and then they take an uncorrelated allocation to macro to benefit from the plenty of opportunities that will be out there over the next five to ten years this is global macro so your asset class all around the world all around the world. So Japan, for example, Japanese equities might as well be into the fund as uh, a Brazilian FX trade might be in there or bond trades in Europe might be in there. It's really global macro opportunities. Where are the, wherever the opportunities are, that's what the fund will be uh, deploying. There is an early investor window for the fund. That means that people that want to get in early, and there is this window running right now, 60% is already taken. So there is quite, uh, there's not a lot of space left, but if people are interested to try and get in as an early investor, there are advantageous conditions to be an early investor into the fund. Well, well when are you launching it? So the fund plan is to launch somewhere in late summer um, or early fall this year. So now we are talking about, you know, the initial conversations with investors, the setup of the fund and everything. So there is this early window right now to basically lock in advantageous conditions to be an early investor into the fund. 
And if people are interested to get in, into this window or receive more information, they can just reach out to me. We can tell them where and how, but it's easy. You just reach out to me, receive the documentation, have a look at it, have a chat with me and decide. You're still going to keep the uh, macro compass up on Zoom? Yes, of course. Of course. Those yeah. two things are completely independent. The macro compass is an educational platform where I share my framework, information, analysis. Running a fund is a different story. It has all to do with your strategies, your correlation, your sizing, your risk management. It's two different things. This is probably, answer this however you like, but would you ever take a position that may be contrary to what you write in the micro, macro compass? Um, no, I don't think so. No. I mean, ultimately, the macro compass is about sharing a framework, sharing okay. the analysis of the economic cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it it really will interfere much at all with the uh, right. I think, I, I think, let me reframe the question differently. Would, would an investor like yourself have an execution that may, on on paper, look like it's contrary to your overall or larger grand scheme macro Framework. Oh, if yes. you meant that, yes, of course, of course. I mean, as, as an investor, you need to be very tactical sometimes. Yes. You need to be able to park your biases. And if you think that... Uh, so suppose, world... suppose you think the Fed's going to make a policy error later on in the year that's going to cause ramifications for the economy, perhaps even cause an equity market sell-off, but you're still long the equity markets right now. Do you see what I mean? Yes, and you're totally right. It might as well be the case. And as an investor, one of the most important things is to be nimble. It's to be nimble and to park your long-term biases home. Don't bring them into the office because you don't want to be anchored to your long-term biases. You want to be tactical and nimble. When opportunities arise, you should be able to get them, not be stopped by your macro biases. Very smart question. And one of the most important features, I think, of a successful investor is to be nimble. Yeah, okay. Well, um, good luck explaining to all the people on Twitter who are going to be like, why are you doing this when you're saying that? So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, you know, Dr Drucken Miller, I think, is one of the guys that says, I go on CNBC and I say I'm short equities. And then maybe the week after I'm long equities because things have <laughs> changed, you know? And then people look at my declaration like, dude, you were supposed to be short equities. Like, suppose yeah. how? I'm an investor. I am nimble. Yes. Anyway, I think we forgot to say, where can people send an email if they're interested into the fund? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Where can we, where can we contact you, learn about you and, uh, you know, all that? <laughs> So to be uh, potentially qualified as an early investor, the minimum allocation at this stage is $250,000. And the email to be sent that is fund at the macrocompass.com. Okay. Uh, what about uh, your other work? Where can we find you there? Oh, yeah, that's pretty simple. It's the macrocompass.com. That's the website. And then uh, Twitter at macroalf, okay. occasionally macro, t macro tweets, occasionally pizza pictures, whatever you prefer. <laughs> trying to stimulate the economy making us hungry go buy pizza very smart thank you very much for your time we'll put the links down below we'll speak to you next time thanks david this show provides you with timely information to help manage your assets one of your most important assets is your online data and it is under threat in 2022 over 13.5 million americans fell victim to identity theft 2022 also had the second highest number of data breaches with at least 422 million individuals affected each time you sign up to a new online service, you provide personal data that hackers can steal, and having that data online limits your privacy. You can ask companies which store your data to delete it, but submitting removal requests manually can take weeks, if not months. Thankfully, there is an easier way, Incogni. Incogni automatically submits data removal requests, scrubbing your data from data brokers' lists. And it's simple to use. Just create an account, grant Incogni the right to work on your behalf, and then just relax and allow Incogni to take care of everything. So take your personal data back with Incogni. Use the code down below David Lin at the link and get 60% off on an annual plan. The data is yours to protect, so don't wait to protect your data online. Click on the link down below.